Good morning and welcome during these challenging times to our fourth virtual Sunday service. My name is Becky Strum. I'm a member of this congregation and this morning I am delighted to be serving as worship associate for a very special service. Members of the CVUUS Sangha, a Buddhist meditation group that has been meeting since 2013, will be presenting this service, sharing their thoughts on how to be a climate activist without having your heart broken will be Colleen Brown, Bobby Carnwaith, Jack Carter, and Dinah Smith. Whether you come to CVUUS every single Sunday, once in a while, whether you're joining us for the very first time virtually, we hope you will come back again to the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society. Our services are always varied, but especially now when we're making use of new technology and new resources, we are excited to bring you meaningful virtual Sunday services. There have always been and still continue to be multiple ways to connect with one another in addition to Sunday services. Nowadays, the best way to keep abreast of all of the opportunities is to check out the weekly blast. Be on the lookout for CVUUS Caring Community Circles and also Reverend Barnaby's commuu yun emails each week. Our call to worship this morning is adapted from the words of Buddhist teacher of Ecodharma, David Lloyd. It is from his 2019 article, Can Buddhism Meet the Climate Crisis? He says, the environmental challenge that confronts us is spiritual. It goes to the very heart of how we understand the world, including our place and role in the world. It seems as if this eco-crisis may be the Earth's way of telling us to wake up or suffer the consequences. If so, we cannot expect technology, economics, politics, or science to present the whole answer. Something more is called for. The teachings and practice of Buddhism may be a key part of that something more. My name's Dinah Smith. I'm a member of the CVUUS Sangha and a sometime flower fixer for CVUUS. This chalice symbolizes the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope. Our chalice lighting responsive reading is based on the words of historian, writer, activist, and Buddhist scholar Rebecca Salnit adapted from an interview. I'll read the italicized text and let's all read the bold text together. Hope is tough and hope gives strength. Hope is often seen as weakness because it is vulnerable, but it takes strength to enter into that vulnerability of being open to the possibilities. Hope is tough and hope gives strength. We all benefit when we explore what gives people that strength. Hope is tough and hope gives strength. In these times, we need to ask each other what stories, what questions, what memories, what conversations, what senses of ourselves and the world around us give us hope. Hope is tough and hope gives us strength. We can find more hope and more strength 
in the hope and strength of others. Hope is tough and hope gives us strength. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to seek what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. And may we walk in peace. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to seek what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. And may we walk in peace. And even during these quarantine times, we want to celebrate sadnesses, happinesses, struggles and successes, joys and concerns. Steve Mayer reports that his son, Eric, and Francois succeeded in recording the audio version of Francois's autobiography in just four days, a marathon bit of work by any standard necessitated by COVID-19 work restrictions and a deadline from the publisher. Dorothy Mammon shares that she is very grateful to be home after making a 23-day, 3,200 nautical mile sailing passage from the Galapagos to the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia. During the passage, while they were still nine days from making landfall, the U.S. State Department issued a level four advisory calling all Americans to come home immediately or be prepared to shelter in place. Bracing for the virus, French Polynesia closed its doors to tourism suspended inter-island flights and put strict confinement measures in place. Four days before arrival, Dorothy was told that repatriation from the Marquesas was not going to be possible. At the 11th hour, however, a private charter was organized to fly the 700 miles from the islands to Tahiti in time for the last commercial international flight out of Tahiti for the indefinite future a United flight to San Francisco. Dorothy connected to Boston, then drove home, where 14 days of self-quarantine can't touch the joy and gratitude she feels. From Kate Gridley, emotions are running high this week, nationally and internationally, it seems, and John and I are not immune. Our son Charles, who is immunocompromised, is in Italy at the epicenter. And for all of you who know him, is holding steady with his partner, Julia, by his side. He says he feels safer there than here. Rather a commentary on the rollout of protocols, behaviors, and dysfunctional national leadership. The Italian curve is starting to plateau, thank heavens. John and I feel grateful to live in Vermont with all of you. Vermont's leadership is doing a great job so far, sending our love to everyone we cannot see.
This is the time in our service for some silent meditation. Today, since we're focused on Buddhist practice, I am going to actually guide you through the meditation and urge you to begin by getting comfortable. If you are sitting on a chair, move a little bit forward to the edge of the chair and put your feet flat on the floor with your ankles below your knees and your knees lower than your hips. If you want to sit on the floor, I urge you to have a cushion underneath you so that your knees are again lower than your hips and you're comfortable. Let your back relax, have your shoulders above your hips, let your tongue rest lightly behind your teeth, close your eyes so your gaze is either of nothing or of just six feet or so in front of you. Let your shoulders roll back and down and do a body scan to make sure nothing is holding on, nothing is tight. If you find something tight, let it go. Now take a nice deep in breath and then exhale long and thoroughly. Now just breathe regularly. Notice when you're inhaling. Notice when you're exhaling. Stay present to the breath. You might notice the inhale is longer or shorter than the exhale. That's fine. Don't force or push. Just let the breath come in and out. Imagine how the air is filling your lungs, starting at the bottom, filling all the way up the way a water pitcher is filled. And as you exhale, the breath is leaving your lungs from the top first and then from the bottom. Just watch the breath coming in going out. You'll probably notice some thoughts popping up in your mind. That's fine. That's what the mind does. It creates thoughts. But imagine that you're in a theater and the thoughts are just going across the stage. Let them go across without interacting. And breathe. Stay focused right here, right now. Continue to come back to the breath whenever you notice your mind has wandered. practice of bringing the mind back. Bring your attention to the breath. Slowly open the eyes, gently bring yourself back to where you are, and notice how beautiful the breath is, and how grateful you are that you can find that place of quiet and peacefulness whenever you want. Our ancient reading this morning is a sequence of quotes from Den Dogen Genji, the Japanese Buddhist priest, writer, poet, philosopher, and founder of the Japanese Soto School of Zen, 
from the early 1200s. A flower falls even though we love it. A weed grows even though we do not love it. When the old plum tree blooms, the entire world blooms. Mountains and oceans have whole worlds of wondrous features. We should understand that it is not only our distant surroundings that are like this, but even what is right here, even a single drop of water. Meditation is not a way to enlightenment, nor is it a method of achieving anything at all. It is peace itself. It is the actualization of wisdom, the ultimate truth of the oneness of all things. Now for the modern reading is excerpted, excerpted and edited from an interview with Joanna Macy, an echo philosopher and a scholar of Buddhism, general systems theory, a deep ecology. She had it with Krista Tippett on, on, the, on being show in 2010. Macy has been a wise, clear and consistent Buddhist voice in the movements for peace, justice and the environment since the 1960s. When she was asked about the grief she experiences daily from the ongoing and catastrophic destruction of our planet by the human race, and especially by the so-called developed countries, this is how Joanna Macy responded. Grief, me got, grief got me into my work. In my teaching and activism, I do encourage people to hold on to their grief and to take their grief seriously. But mostly I encourage them not to be afraid of that grief. What I know is that if you are afraid of grief and pave it over, there's a good chance that you will cause, it will cause you to clamp down or try to push away your grief. And then you may just shut down. That can lead to a kind of apathy and denial. The difficulty in looking at what you're doing to our world stems not from callous indifference or ignorance so much as it stems from fear of pain. This fear around destruction of our earth encompasses everything. What's in our food, the clear cuts of our forests, the contamination of our rivers and oceans. And once I recognize that, it became the most pivotal point in the landscape of my life. I had to learn to dance with despair, to see how we are called not to run from discomfort and, deep, and deeply benefit when we choose not to run from the grief, outrage, and fear. I needed to remind myself of the wisdom we all have within ourselves, to recognize that if we can be fearless and be without our pain, all of that turns. It doesn't stay static. The only way these feelings don't change is if we refuse to look at them. When we stay with the despair we feel for our environment and our world and we keep breathing, then it turns, it changes. That despair turns to review, reveal its other face. And the other face of our pain for the world is our love for the world our absolutely inseparable connectedness with all life. That is how we move forward toward healing. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bobby Cornwall, longtime member and frequent flower fixer at this church. The service this morning has been put together by the CBU US Sangha. The title of our talk this morning is How to Be a Climate Change Activist Without Having Your Heart Broken, a Buddhist Perspective. About 20 years ago, I attended a series of group discussions about deep ecology, sponsored by Spirit and Nature. We read and talked about the subtle interconnectedness of all things as we explored the impact of modernism and population growth on the environment. I was saddened by the extent to which my privileged way of life was deleterious to less fortunate people and to nature, the nature that has always fed me both physically and spiritually. That was when I first became concerned about climate change. 
with Paul Bortz, UU minister, and Laura Assermoli and Tracy, whose last name wasn't Harrington back then. I began working to spread climate change awareness in our community, if only on Earth Day, then celebrated on the Green, where we asked people to pledge to cut back on their climate footprint. Flash forward a few years. Vermont announced plans to run a pipeline to carry frack gas from Canada through West Central Vermont. For about four years, from spring of 2013 till early 2017, Jack and I spent a huge amount of our time, energy and creativity in an effort to diminish reliance on fossil fuels by acting locally to stop the pipeline. We attended meetings and demonstrations knocked on doors, wrote letters and speeches, marched carrying signs, kayaked waving banners. We carpooled regularly to Montpelier, where we sat through technical hearings and serenaded members of the Public Service Board with Christmas carols with droll fracking-related lyrics. We applauded as brave members of this church were arrested. Then, on April 12, 2017, we read that the pipeline to Middlebury had been completed. That proved to me that greed was deeply programmed into human enterprise without any meaningful concern for the environment. That was heartbreaking. I did not have the will to tackle any new climate battle that would inevitably end in defeat. I attended workshops in our church sanctuary based on Johanna Macy's inspiring work on active hope. It was comforting to know that I was not alone in my despair, but I felt that embracing any kind of hope was just a lie to myself. Three years later, climate science is irrefutable. The challenge appears more daunting and I feel paralyzed in the face of the relentless environmental degradation. However, I'm still holding back from getting deeply involved with climate justice activism. Instead, my response to my crippling sense of helplessness has been to channel my time and attention into seeking spiritual help with my dilemma. I've dabbled in Buddhism since college, so that seemed like a good place to start. As you may know, one of the ongoing ministries of this church has been to host a Sangha, a Sangha is a group of seekers of a mindful life informed by Buddhism. As I've been witnessing relentless assaults on the two awesome entities that are at the core of my spiritual well-being, the natural environment and compassionate democracy, I've found myself turning toward Buddhism, more specifically toward the teachings of contemporary Zen masters. Today, we regulars at the Sunday Sangha, I want to share four of the core Buddhist teachings that can help to relieve the suffering that is the result of human-induced climate change. One, waking up. Sitting meditation is at the heart of Buddhist tradition. Although meditation is sometimes called mindfulness training, the aim of sitting for a Buddhist is different. It's not to train the mind, but to still the mind to watch attentively playing the role of an observer of our own thoughts as we try to let go of the mundane chatter and suspend all judgmental thinking. We just sit still and let thoughts pass by without getting involved in them. Over time, the result of this practice is that we wake up to the vast universal reality within which we had been dreaming our lives. As we continue our practice, we begin to see what is. To see what really is, is to be awake. When we are asleep and dreaming at night, we flash from one vision, one emotion to another. We sometimes pass our days in a similar disjointed way. That is not how we want to live out our precious lives. We want to be awake so that we experience not study or remember or read about. Experience deeply what is here now in a bare and immediate way. Perhaps most importantly, we notice how our thoughts add to 
even create our own problems. What Buddhists usually refer to as suffering. And that sadly, we are the cause of the suffering of others. With practice, we develop a steadier gaze and thoughts, feelings, and suffering are seen to be quiet ripples in the vastness of reality. In order to achieve this heightened state of awareness, we need to give ourselves permission to take time off from what we might consider more important use of our time. Just as there is no substitute for a long night's rest, for waking up refreshed and being at our best during the day, there is no shortcut to sitting. Practicing mindfulness transforms our perceptions of ourself in a way that makes active involvement in protecting our environment natural and inevitable. Care for the environment and care for the self are one and the same. The illusion of our separateness may be one of the root causes of the crisis we are in. As we develop our understanding of our interconnectedness, we realize that we are required to act with mindfulness toward other people, animals, plants, and minerals that share our earth because we are all intimately connected. Two, impermanence. Central to the Buddhist understanding of the world is the fact that everything that exists is impermanent. Nothing remains as it was or as it is now. This is a good time to talk about suffering. The first teaching the Buddha gave after his enlightenment was about suffering. We have come to call this early teaching the Four Noble Truths. The first truth is there is suffering. Truths two through four declare that suffering is a result of our own desires and actions, and consequently, that our suffering can cease if we follow a right-minded course of action. Much, if not all, of human suffering comes from our inability to accept impermanence. But it's not really the impermanence that makes us suffer. What makes us suffer is wanting things to be permanent when they are not. As we experience our lives mindfully, aware of the impermanence of all things, teaches us to respect and value every moment and all the precious things around us and inside us. Impermanence is not just here to be overcome and conquered. It is also to be lived and appreciated. Impermanence is what makes transformation possible. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote, long live impermanence, with three exclamation marks. Thanks to impermanence, suffering gives way to joy. Mindfulness is the impermanence of everything, of the impermanence of everything leads us to the serenity of re-examining and ultimately accepting change, working with it and within it, and appreciating the relief from suffering, the joy that change can bring. Three, refuge in the Sangha. The Buddha felt very strongly about the power of community to support the path of awakening. Thich Nhat Hanh defines the Buddhist Sangha in a way that makes it clear how essential it community is community of like-intentioned people is to the Buddhist practitioner when he said that the Sangha is a community of people who agree with each other that if we do not practice right mindfulness, we will lose all the beautiful things in our soul and all around us. The energy of mindfulness that is generated by our personal practice is often not enough, but if we use the, that energy in order to build the collective energy of the Sangha, we have collective power for transformation and healing. The existence of Sangha is what makes Buddhism a living, applied, spiritual tradition, rather than a mere philosophy. Lama Willa B. Cather pointed to the importance of group effort by telling the story of a friend of hers who attended a city council meeting in her community and ran into a woman who was repeatedly raising the issue of banning plastic bags. Discouraged, the woman said that she could not seem to earn the respect of city council. Her friend replied that you don't need respect, you need a friend. One person is a nut, two people are a wake-up call, three people are a movement. 
When it comes to the challenge of climate change, Buddhists and non-Buddhists alike tend to focus on personal lifestyle changes, such as electric cars, solar panels, and eating less meat. Although these things are important, they are not sufficient responses to our increasingly urgent situation. As Bill McKibben wrote in a Ryan article, if 10 or even 15% of us do everything we can to reduce our own carbon footprint, the trajectory of our horror remains about the same. Yet, he adds, if even 10% of us also work all out to change the system, that will be more than enough. On another occasion, Bill McKibben, responding to the question, what can one person do to stop climate change, said, stop being an individual. Four, attachment, not knowing. Yes, I'm sneaking two concepts in here because our response to climate change, these two feet, feed on each other. Impermanence may be one cause of suffering that is inescapable, but the good news is that most other causes of suffering can, with consistent mindful practice, be controlled or even eliminated. One of the major roots of suffering is attachment to things as they are, or a desire to have things as we want them to be. Conversely, the key to avoiding this pervasive kind of suffering is by practicing non-attachment. To desire, to not desire things, to be one particular way, as David Loy said in his recent book, Echo Dharma, clinging to concepts, functions, and cravings is how we close ourselves up. When we attach to something, we suffer and others suffer because we're holding on to things that may not be important in the present moment. This can apply to relationships, friends, experiences, or stuff. By accepting the true nature of everything as being impermanent, we release our desires and we open our hearts. Loy writes that we shouldn't think of our non-attachment as a form of indifference or a form of self-denial. Think of non-attachment as a way of not allowing things in your life to control you. Again, we are not just talking about tangible things. Attitudes and old habits are also forms of attachment that can cause suffering by blocking the truth. In the short term, non-attachment allows us to be and to act in the world with equanimity because we are unattached to the fruits of our actions. This is not the same as not caring. I think Loy was talking directly to me when he wrote, non-attachment is essential in the face of the inevitable setbacks and frustrations that activism involves. But it does not mean, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that one is unconcerned about the results of one's efforts. Given the urgency of the challenge, we work as hard as we can. When our efforts do not bear fruit in the ways we had hoped, we naturally feel some disappointment, but we do not remain stuck there. Non-attachment allows us to experience the world with what Buddhists call a don't know mind or beginner's mind. In Buddhism, not knowing does not mean ignorance. It means letting go of fixed ideas about yourself, others, and the universe. The only realistic way to live in a world where nothing is certain because nothing transcends impermanence is by leading with a not knowing mind. Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind is the name of an infinitely rereadable little book by Suzuki Roshi. In it, he points out that beginner's mind is wide open and questioning, while the expert's mind is closed. From childhood, we learned that the world of knowing is filled with gold stars and praise. But like it or not, there are limitations to our ability to know. When we detach ourselves from our desire to have all the answers, admit the truth that there is much that we don't and can't know, everything changes. Of course, we can't live solely in a state of not knowing. Life also asks that we face our ever-changing situation by being present to what is happening now. It all comes down to this, said another Buddhist teacher, sweeping his hands across the floor. Cleared away, return to zero. What we see, what we do, what we smell, what we taste, what do we touch, that is truth. 
what we know blocks the truth. The more we fear uncertainty, the more likely we are to hide behind myths and wishful thinking. Our worst enemy might not be climate denial, but rather a subtle subconscious rejection of climate change based on our fear of the unknown. If we embrace the truth of uncertainty, we can develop the courage to stay open and engage with the facts as they are. Then we can invest ourselves in the possibility of collective action. Thich Nhat Hanh is known for promoting the idea that seeing reality and activism go together. He called it engaged Buddhism. His teaching on activism is that mindfulness gives people the ability to find peace in themselves so that their actions come from a place of compassion. Mindfulness must be engaged, he wrote. Once we see that something needs to be done, we must take action. Seeing and action go together. Otherwise, what is the point in seeing? The Addison Natural Gas Pipeline Project taught me that science-based reasoning is not going to save our planet from our climate problem. Gus Speth, a US advisor on climate change, once said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environment problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. The Buddha attained individual awakening. Now we need a collective awakening to stop the course of destruction. In 2010, a NASA study declared that automobiles were officially the largest net contributor of climate change pollution in the world. Yet in 2018, Americans bought over 17 million new vehicles for the fourth year in a row. And 68% of them were trucks and SUVs. No cultural transformation there. While we need to continue to rely on science to inform us through this climate emergency, it is obvious that Speth, as Speth said, the top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. I'll end as I started on a personal note. I have spent many over the last two months immersed in contemporary Zen teaching, partly to prepare for this morning's talk, but mostly in hopes of weaving together strands that would motivate me to get back on track to participate in making the change I want to see. Practicing mindfulness through meditation, finding energy in the impermanence of everything, and cultivating non-attachment and not knowing is beginning to quiet my mind so that I can feel ready to wade into the practice of engaged Buddhism. Again, Thich Nhat Hanh. The Buddha of our time may not be an individual, but it might be a Sangha. Once the Buddhist disciple, Ananda, asked him if having good spiritual friends was very important for the path, whether they were perhaps half the path. No, Ananda, the Buddha told him, having good friends isn't half the holy life. Having good friends is the whole of it. The CPUUS Sangha is fortunate to have a community of good friends in each other and in the people who meet on Sunday mornings in the Unitarian Universalist services. My recent self-guided research into Buddhism has reminded me that for activists who are committed to sustaining this dynamic community called Earth, connections are vital. What we call self, not so much. Our closing words are the Buddhist evening gatha. A gatha is a prayer. And this one is an ancient chant believed to have first appeared in an essay by Dogen 
called The Great Matter of Life and Death. Before I read these words, I'd like to give you a little explanation for the prayer. Here's how the Zen Buddhist teacher Norman Fisher interpreted it when he was interviewed by the Lion's Roar magazine in 2004. He said, we're always struggling against the fleetingness of time. In Dogen's understanding of time, every moment is intimate and complete. Even at the moment, we aren't exerting ourselves, even when we think we are confused and there is no time. Time is complete. Life is complete. All of the past and the future are in fruition at every point. And that's the part that's so comforting and intimate. I urge you to close your eyes and take in this evening gatha. Let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time swiftly passes by and opportunity is lost. On this night, the days of our lives are decreased by one. Each of us should strive to awaken, awaken, take heed, do not squander your life. <laughs>